continuing our story in the uh, Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. We're going in through chapter 12 on objections. So this chapter is pretty interesting. So he's kicking it off with, um, I think, a number of interesting responses to main objections, which a lot of people have to an anarchist or even just a communist society in general, specifically concerns about work, right? Like this is the one we always hear. This is the one that was very common in Kropotkin's time and clearly is still common today. It's like, well, if everybody's provided for, then nobody's ever going to work. And he breaks up the argument into two general forms, right? So he has a first section of the argument in which he's objecting to the possibility that individuals in and of themselves will be less productive if society was organized in a second way. And then he goes on to argue against the freeloader objection. So he div divides it up. And I think that this division, Chris, is really important, right? Because I think that even in today's debate, you'll hear a lot of people lump these two arguments in together. And then whenever you attack one side of it, then they'll just pop out and then, you know, use concerns about the other. And then it just becomes a sort of, I mean, I don't remember, what's the name of that arcade game where like, you know, you're just hitting the, hitting the different uh, ones and then the other one just oh, pops whack -a -mole. out. <laughs> yeah, whack-a-mole. It just becomes a game of uh, whack-a-mole when you're trying to respond to or answer these sorts of, uh, answer these sorts of objections. And so for him to sort of lump them together and then split them up and then hit both sides of it, I think is uh, pretty effective there. So Chris, do you have any comments on chapter 12 to open it yeah, up? Yeah, just, uh, you know, he did attack this idea and I've actually heard this on my stream when I'm talking to people and I kind of uh, attack capitalism a little bit and people always come back with that. Well, how are people going to work if they're not earning money for their wage? And I got to say, I, I, I like a lot of the arguments that he puts forward in here, but I don't know that you're going to convince too many people who are kind of on that other side and want to stick to that capitalism is great idea. I don't know if these arguments will be convincing enough to mm -hmm. individuals like that. I mean, I, one thing that I found very, very persuasive was this argument that um, if you were free to pursue the things that interested you, that made you that you were passionate about and you could find some something that was still considered work, not a pastime, but the, the work of the four to five hours that you'd be putting in per day. If you could find something in that area that matched up with your interests, you would be much more interested in going to work and putting in that day's work because you believe in what you're doing. Right now in this capitalist system, you sort of go where you can get paid and you might not even necessarily believe in what you're doing. And then also the conditions of the factories and the, the the employment places themselves are oftentimes, you know, why would you want to go there? If you're, you know, the one of the things he brought up in here was bad, bad work for bad pay. So if these capitalists are always cutting your pay down lower and lower and lower, you're, and you don't feel like you're being fairly compensated, you're not going to go to want to want to go to work. If you're going there and there's a factory and the factory is dark and it's loud and your hearing is getting damaged and all sorts of, you know, you're not going to want to spend your day there. So uh, I think he makes a good point to say that if, if profit is your motive, you're going to end up with workplaces that are not pleasant places to spend your day. Whereas if you let the workers decide, they're going to make those changes that make it more enjoyable to be there during the day. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why you're less likely to see uh, this idea of people just kind of loafing around. Plus, there would obviously be a change in culture. I mean, we already kind of have a culture where we value hard work and people who go out and work hard and that kind of stuff. I think you would still see that, especially as it became more important. Uh, I, I think there would be kind of this outcast mentality that if you're just seen as feeding off society you know there might be some social pressures that push you yeah. to not be like well there's that. a lot of questions there which i'm sure that uh that we'll get to some concerns that i was raising to you uh sort of before we started our uh started our stream but kind of let's i guess go through the arguments that he gives us because he has very specific arguments for why he thinks the things that he thinks so at the get-go of this uh at the chapter here at the beginning he says quote it is not for us to answer the objections raised by authoritarian communism right so he's saying that the kind of what he has called earlier in the book bourgeois communism which he's conflated with uh marx fairly or not that's what he's called it um and he's saying that it's not to us to answer those objections and objections specifically in that uh in that vein because we oppose that kind of authoritarian uh communism as well in fact throughout this you'll notice if you're paying 
close attention while you're reading chapter 12, you'll notice that he's not just criticizing capitalism, he's criticizing Marx just as much as he's, crit as he's criticizing capitalism and the uh, uh, system of wages, which he believes continues in through state communism. Um, but going through a little bit more, because, um, you know, that's sort of just a focus it, that he is talking about the anarchist approach to things. He says here, um, let us consider, or, ex excuse me here, he says uh, down at the bottom of what's the first page, page for me, he says, quote, let us see if a society composed of men as they are today, neither better nor worse, neither more nor less industrious, would have a chance of successful development. I think that this is an important aspect for him to go down on. I think that a lot of people will criticize anarchism or communism as being just this sort of idealist fantasy that they're imagining people as they are not yet. The The famous criticism is to say that communists imagine men to be angels, right? And this is clearly not what Kropotkin excuse me, what, what Kropotkin has in mind here. He's saying here, no, we're not angels. Let's imagine us as we are today and see if we can develop arguments, which is going to get us to an anarchist system. Um, and then he says, of course, then he goes on to the specific objection. He says, the objection is known. If the existence of each is guaranteed and if it is, uh, and if the necessary of earning, wa if the necessity of earning wages does not compel men to work, nobody will work. Every man will lay down, the, will lay the burden of his work on another if he is not not forced to do it himself. And he has an interesting corollary to hear later into the chapter where he specifically points out that the ultimate motiva motivation for people to work hard in a capitalist society is for them to get ahead, not just for themselves future into life, but also for their children. But ultimately what that means is that their ultimate goal in working hard is so that one day they don't have to work and that their work will then all be offloaded onto other people. In other words, the ultimate goal of working hard in a capitalist society, according to Kropotkin, is the, maintain is the maintenance of the capitalist system itself. And so he, of course, has a major problem with that, right? So his objection then is going to hinge on the badness, we might say, of the wage system itself. Because he argue he's essentially saying then that the wage, or excuse me, that the motivation for working hard in the capitalist system is not necessarily for your own benefit, but for the possibility of then in the future exploiting labor uh, going forward. So that's going to be a difficult thing for him to respond to. But he has, I think, and, and I think, Chris, you'll agree with me that this is actually quite fascinating, um, his maneuver here. He goes here um, and he says, the first note of incredible... Um, Actually, let me start off the beginning of that sentence. He says, let us first note the incre incredible levity with which this objection is raised, referring to the objection of, well, basically nobody's going to work, without even realizing that the real question being raised by this objection is merely to know, on the one hand, whether you are effectively, uh, whether you effectively obtain by wage, uh, wage, wage work the results that are said to be obtained, and on the other hand, whether voluntary work is not already now more productive than work stimulated by wages. And so I think that this goes into what he says later, because he's essentially, like we've talked about um, so many different times throughout this, uh, throughout this series here, Kropotkin is trying to develop a scientific approach to sociology, which is grounded in the work of Darwin, right? And so his view for how we can develop a rational and scientific society is that we must develop a science or a sociology or what he's going to refer to later down in this same page, at least for me, as a political economy in which, quote, um, or excuse me, that the quote, that the basis of all political economy should be the study of the most favorable conditions for giving society the greatest amount of useful products with the least waste of human energy. And so he's saying that this is the definition of what the science of economics and what political economy must be. And if it's not aimed at that, then it's not like it's essentially just a sort of it's it, it's ultimately a pseudoscience right and he also goes on to say here how uh quote but whereas in exact sciences such as we might say physics or chemistry men give their give their opinion on subjects infinitely less important and less complicated after serious research and after serious collection and careful analysis of the facts and data on this question they will pronounce judgments um without appeal and with resting satisfied with only one particular event such as for example the want of success of some uh, some small communist association in America. And so when it comes to these complicated sciences of sociology, which I should say, he is um, 
He's relying here on the work of, I believe, August Comte, who um, essentially argued that there's different stages for the development of scient uh, scientific uh, scientific theories, putting physics, of course, is the hallmark of science as we know it today, but then as we advance, we'll move into stages of psychology and then to sociology. And so he's saying here that sociology is a much more complicated science than physics. That's why we haven't managed to like sort of drill down on these, you know, clear rules. And that, and that seems reasonable. I mean, it's assuming certain things about, uh, about metaphysics but it seems like a, a you know, prima facie plausible uh, claim here. Um, but he's claiming that sociology here is just so complicated, and yet people will rest content because supposedly you can't have exact answers. They'll just rest content with giving you one example. Oh, well, there we go. Um, so I don't know, Chris. I find that a really interesting approach to science. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess that I'll just leave it at that. Like, this is a very curious approach to science. What do you think? But yeah, I mean, he. Ta I, I have that highlighted too. the study of the most favorable conditions for giving society the greatest amount of useful products with the least waste of human energy. Um, and he goes back to this idea of that waste of human energy. And, you know, somewhere in here, I forget where it was, but he talks about how we put people doing these jobs that are very tedious. Like I think he mentions punching the hole into like a needle, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of a thing that you're going to sit there and do. 5,000 times a day. Well, no one wants to do that kind of a job, right? And he'll say, we create this waste, this waste of human energy to put a few more dollars in the capitalist pocket. But like, what is, what is it you're taking from society in that way? I mean, you're creating people who don't want to go to work and who don't want to participate, you know, in this job, who would want to sit there and, and, you know, just pull one crank 5,000 times a day. And as we know, that's not even healthy for humans to do the same repetitive motion all day long. So there's kind of this, uh, yeah, there's this, yeah. this human waste that then leads us down this wrong, wrong path, I would say, which goes to that argument of well, people don't want to do this kind of work. You have to make the work suitable to human beings as, as well. Right. Yeah. And he has an interesting gesture towards, I think, his view of science, or at least the science of sociology. He says in just a few paragraphs down, he says here, quote, what is most striking about this levity is that, uh, uh, again, levity referring to how easily they are, uh, how quickly it'll roll off their tongue, this objection of hard work. Uh, they say, what is most striking about this levity is that even in capitalist political economy, you already find a few writers compelled by facts to doubt the axioms put forth by the founders of their science. That the threat of hunger is man's best stimulant for productive work, right? So he's saying that, like, even among capitalist econ ec economists, they're starting to question this assumption, saying, hold on, this might be the wrong way to approach it, but people will still pronounce with just a few sparse examples, he says, um, on this supposedly obvious objection to, uh, to this point. I think that this is really interesting Right. I think that this is actually a quite astute analysis of human behavior. It's certainly something that I think that we've all maybe noticed. But I think that Kropotkin here is actually uh, gesturing towards a solution to why that might be right. That, uh, you know, in a certain sense, that because of the fact that this science is uh, much more complicated, according to Kropotkin, that people think that since supposedly there can't be exact answers, people say, well, then any example must be or any answer must be um, acceptable. Uh, and I think that, uh, I don't know, I think that this is an interesting way to think about the science of sociology. I'm not quite sure how I'm, how much I agree, but it's, I think, uh, in a worthwhile contribution. Yeah. I mean, sociology is just such a tricky kind of science anyways. I mean, it's not like you follow the same tracks that you do with say a physics or something like that. I mean, that's, you know, it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a muddier science, and certainly I would a, think, a hundred, but, you know, a hundred something years ago, certainly even more so. Right, right. So it seems like you know, certainly harder to track those things down and really treat it as like a hardcore science where you definitely know, you know, you, we feel strongly about this thing. I mean, it, it's definitely harder to track. So uh, yeah, kind of a difficult thing to. Well, it's it's. I mean, I suppose it's an open question whether or not that's because of some kind of irreducible complexity, or whether or not that's because, uh, you know, we just haven't figured it out yet, right? Like, do the fact that we're relying on these statistical methods tell us something that, oh well, it's just a, a measure of our uncertainty, or is it ultimately just a measure of, well, even if I have all the information in a system, I still can't predict exactly what's going to go on in certain sorts of uh, macro systems. So it's an open question. Um, but I suppose that might be moving a little bit beyond some of what Kropotkin um, 
would think. I think that he would say right. that there are final answers to these questions and that indeed uh, society, just like biology, according to the tracks of evolution, progresses. Um, so in any case, uh, let's move on a little bit from that point there. Um, is, there any, is there any main points that uh, you also want to hit on here in part one still? In part two, what are you cutting part, out? In part two? Did in you part say? one. Oh, part one. I think that kind of sums it up. I don't have too much after what we already talked about. Um, uh, actually, there is one really, really important part to not miss in part one. He says here, quote, Moreover, who but the economists themselves taught us that while a wage earner's work is very often indifferent and intense, uh, in, an intense and productive work is, quote, only obtainable from a man who sees his wealth increase in proportion to his efforts. So this is Kropotkin's response to the objection. Um, because, again, remember, he broke up the first part of the objection to basically say that the question is whether or not, on the one hand, voluntary work could possibly be more productive than um, property when it is owned uh, by individuals. And so in a certain sense, he's saying that, like, I suppose he might even think that, like, sort of the the science of economics can't tell you whether or not um, private property is more productive than uh, than um, uh, sort of voluntary communally owned property because it's only assessing on the basis of uh, private property, right? Like it's building models right. based on private property and trying to maximize along the lines of capital, but he's saying that that's what a uh, science of political economy must do. And so his claim here is that productivity is only obtained when a man sees his wealth increase in proportion to its efforts. So, of course, this goes into some of the stuff that he talks about later about the sort of shoddy pay for shoddy work, the go canny, I believe is what he called it, uh, that, uh, well, you know, if you give me an order to work really, really hard, I know I shouldn't follow that because if I work really, really hard, then that's just going to be the standard and I am not going to get paid anymore because, right, like if right. I if I come into it every single day giving 100, that means that suddenly that's going to be the bare minimum giving 100. So if I give 80, then that's going to be the bare minimum. And so there's no incentive, according to Kropotkin, in the private property system uh, to give it your all. And not only that um, – it, or excuse me, it isn't. There is no incentive to give it your all because it's going to be taken away from you, and so your work, your output doesn't, and in, in your benefit for yourself, your well-being doesn't improve in proportion to the efforts that you're putting into it in a capitalist system. So that's his objection to the lazy, uh, lazy person argument. Yeah, I think there's some validity there that right now most of us do work that is so disconnected from from results that we're able to see. You just go somewhere, you perform some function, uh, probably not very rewarding. Like, you know, he mentions a number of tedious tasks where it's not even like you get to make a whole project and then at the end of the day feel good about your project. It's like, like he was saying, just this repetitive punching holes and needles or whatever. You take that, you take the... Uh, that feeling of accomplishment and being proud about something, you take that out of the action, then of course people are not going to be very excited about doing their work and you don't give them the creativity to change their work environment to better suit them, to make the day more enjoyable, to maybe be creative with stuff a little bit or find new ways to, you know, if, if everyone in the factory was sitting there and trying to find new ways to make it run a little bit more efficient so they could work a little less for the same amount of stuff, you know, then people would do that. But what do you care if, if coming up with new efficiencies just means the guy at the top makes a little more money and you're not going to see any of that anyways, then you're going to be totally disconnected from, from any of that. And yeah, you're not going to feel real great about being at work. Right. And he even says so much. He says here, quote, by admitting that the only guarantee not to be robbed of the fruits of our labor is to possess the instruments of our labor. And so if we don't ultimately right. own our labor and own our production, own the means of production, have control over it, then, you know, the, the surplus there is just going to get taken off. It's going to get shaved off the top and we don't get to see it. So as a result, our well-being doesn't improve in proportion to the input that we put in, right? He's saying that it kind of, I suppose, in a, in a rational system, in a system in which I'm controlling things, you know, the harder I work, you know, the more I put in, the more that I should get out. But he's saying that right. that's not the way that this system works. And so um, it, it, it isn't going to be more efficient, uh, more efficient.
Right. Right. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's a, it's a hard, I think that's one of the things I was talking about. That's a hard case to make to someone who isn't already like open-minded to this kind of stuff. But I think if you come in open-minded, I think that's a reasonable argument. But I think to a lot of people, the idea of having say in your own workplace is so foreign that it's like, oh, well, you're just, that's a fantasy. That's a kind of a dream world that you're living in. Um, but you know, I, I think there's there's validity to it, right? This is like one of the things he talks about pastime and you chase your passions in your pastime. That's one of the things people like is whatever you're working on in your pastime, you get to be creative with it. You get to do it how you think it should be done. You have say, and then when there's an outcome, you get to feel proud of the thing that you accomplished, which right. for, for most people, all that is completely missing in the modern workplace. Right. And he seems to think that we need to do these things uh, together. Like you should be able to choose when you do this part of the task, when you do that other part of the task. Right. And that when you can sort of have that freedom and have that choice, your well-being is going to uh, going to increase. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right. This is a little bit of um, a thought experiment that isn't quite connected to perhaps the re the sort of psychological, we might say, excuse me, reasons why people are objecting to the communist system, like this, this lazy person argument. Um, I don't know, Chris, about, about you, but I've found that it's really important sometimes to speak to the real reasons why someone is objecting to something. Now, this can be difficult because yeah. it's not always clear um, that they're going to tell you why they're actually objecting to something, right? Like, one, you know, uh, smart people right. are particularly good at making up reasons that are not their actual reasons for objecting to things. And so, you know, you right. hit all their arguments that they give you, even if you genuinely knock it down, it's not the real reason why. And so it can become, yeah. you know, really difficult to respond to things. And I think that this is an example here where, um, yeah, you might have an interesting argument. I mean, I suppose that there are some empirical components that may need to be tested, but I'm not sure that any actual person, like the real reason why they're objecting to the communist system is because of the fact that production is going to go down in net. Like, I, I don't think that that's at all why people actually object to it. I think that that's something that people right. say. It seems to be a kind of like, well, I don't like the fact that they're getting something and, you know, they think that they're going to be working infinitely harder than the average person or some, something along that line. It seems to be a much more visceral objection from those who do level that right. objection as opposed to this intellectual objection, which Kropotkin is responding to. And he makes a note in here somewhere. I can't remember exactly where he makes this quote. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. So to avoid a possible evil, you have recourse to means which in themselves are a greater evil. So he's, I guess this is kind of what I think about it. This, in reality, the, the amount of problem that would occur from people being lazy and not working, I think is very, very small, right? And so I think... It's like we we have people objecting to this entire system because of something that may be like probably less than one percent of the population are going to be the issue, right? So we throw this whole this whole concept well, out over what I think is a very very tiny problem. Well, okay, so yes, although um, that's a different argument uh, than the one we were just responding to because he does, as we mentioned there at the beginning, he is splitting up the two arguments. Um, where's the part where he responds specifically to that, to that objection? Um, about five paragraphs into number three, five paragraphs into number three. Yeah. He says, he basically says, uh, this, our opponents agree to, but the danger they say will come from that minority of loafers who will not work and who will not have regular habits in spite of the excellent conditions, which would make their work pleasant going on in the quote a few lines down he says but one black sheep suffices to contaminate a whole flock this is sort of him quoting what other people would say and then later down in that paragraph he says this we believe is the objection fairly stated and this is also sort of lumps into a concern about the state he says that the law courts and all these other things must supposedly according to the authoritarian arise for this concern that people get worried about uh you know about there being a few a few people and so then we have the law court and that's always used as I and, I and I see this even today people use this as an argument for the law court for the police system right there's lazy people there's people who won't work there's those few indolence uh and and people who you know won't follow the regular habits as Kropotkin put it um but he basically says uh 
in response to this quote down um, down a few paragraphs to avoid this possible evil you have recourse to means which in themselves are, are greater evil and become the source of those same abuses that you wish to remedy so I mean this is sort of an allusion to something that uh, is sort of I suppose very topical to much of the political discourse today where, you know, there's concern about police officers and there's possible concern that right. actually when you go into these communities and oppress the uh, and oppress these communities, you actually end up making it worse and create more of the cycles of violence which you seek to remedy. And and you know, I will say this is an interesting observation which I've had, you know, there's there's revenge stories, Chris, um, throughout the beginning of Western literature. I mean, Homer's uh, Odyssey and 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 the Iliad is essentially is essentially that, right? Like a story about how revenge cycles just sort of repeat themselves, and that you need someone to come in and just stop, right? Like that's why the play has to, or not the play, the the is it a play? I don't know. It's not a play. It's a poem. Uh, how it ends with actually like a Deus ex machina, right? Like a god has to come down and then offer kind of forgiveness to stop to stop this uh, from creating another cycle of violence when uh, the king comes home and, uh, you know, attacks all the suitors, right? And that's the only way to actually stop a cycle of violence. You can't respond with retribution, according to Homer, if you want right. to have, um, if you want to continue and have a, basically like a, a, a good society. Now, I'm not a literary, uh, literary critic or expert, but I will say this, this is a very common theme throughout literature. Actually, um, I will say the uh, if any of you played The Last of Us Part Two, it's uh, definitely modeled after uh, Homer's hmm. uh, after parts of Homer, and it has a similar theme, similar message that you just need to at some point put in, in the sort of framing of of The Last of Us, put the guitar down at some point, and um, basically say, you know what, I'm not going to take revenge, and that's the only way actually to find peace and find fulfillment, because otherwise, just the violence is going to continue, and the violence is going to is going to continue. And Kropotkin seems to have a grasp on this idea that ultimately, if we want these abuses to stop, well, then we can't just respond by you know furthering these abuses more. Um, I suppose, right. I suppose though. It is possible to say that this is a bit of a literary response as opposed to a kind of empirical response. There might be reason to think that you could develop some kind of scientific experiment to test when it might be appropriate to respond with a kind of retribution and when not to, right? There might be a little bit more nuance than, um, you know, literary artists might want to always suppose. But certainly I think that I, I think that he's on to something there. Um, what, yeah. am, am I off in, in saying that or? No, I think that's actually the, as far as the literary point, I think that's a very interesting point that you make. I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective of the, of the literary angle, but I, I think that's, that's a good one. I think it definitely kind of shows, yeah, you can't just, you're, you're not going to get to this point by sort of half measuring with capitalism. You're going to have to have something come in and sort of change the system itself, which, which seems to be, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, it seems, you know, Kropotkin seems to be very like an absolutist individual. Like, mm. you know, if something can be corrupted, it's got to go. You have to sort of get rid of it completely because even if you left some remnants of wages inside the system, you're just going to end up back with capitalism again, right? It's just all going to come back this right. direction. And, so. and, and he says so much. He, it's his ultimate response to what he's calling bourgeois uh, communism or the sort of state communism. He says at the very start of part three for this chapter 12, he says they recognize that work paid with money, even uh, disguised under the name of labor checks to workers associations governed by the state, would keep up the characteristics of wagedom, wagedom and retain all of its disadvantages. So the idea being that, well, even if you tried to substitute pay or substitute wages for a kind of labor check, OK, well, you're given, say, four hours of work for working today and then you can have perhaps a ratio. So doctors, you know, maybe get a little bit more. The simple, complex distinction which Kropotkin has criticized earlier in the book, right, um, that ultimately if you do this, you haven't knocked down the wage system entirely. And so you're going to still have that incentive to exploit. Again, going back to that uh, right. quote earlier where the entire incentive uh, in a capitalist society, Kropotkin is arguing, is essentially that one day you won't have to work or that your children won't have to work. Essentially what it would mean for their children to have a better life is that then they would be relying on the labor of others and can sort of sit back and enjoy their luxury on the back of other people. But this means that ultimately the incentive to work hard in a capitalist society is that capitalism would continue, Kropotkin seems to think. And I think that that's a brilliant response. I don't know, like, 
I mean, I, I suppose that there are like empirical questions sort of mixed in here, right? Like it seems like some of this stuff might be, you might be able to test and you might be able to sort of tease out some of these things, right? Um, but it's certainly a, a brilliant argument. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Right. Yeah. And then we were kind of talking about like control and, and stuff a little bit a while ago when it was coming to like the guards and magistrates and policemen. So one thing that struck me in here was he talks about in, um, you know, if you have someone who's lazy, he say, uh, friend, we should like to work with you, but as you are often absent from your post and you do your work negligently, mm. you must part. Go and find other comrades who will put up with your indifference. So uh, what they're saying is if, if you did run across people who were not holding up their fair share, you could sort of run them out. Now, it's not clear to me in the book under what authority or what force you would be using to make that person depart is it merely that they would be sort of shunned from the group is it a is it yeah, a social a constraint where all of a sudden you're saying well you know over there so and so he he's he's a lazy one and then because your society would be all based on this that would probably be I guess you wouldn't really have crimes in this kind of society, but that would be held up as I don't know what the word would but it's sort of a a norm or or something that yeah. that person has broken what we consider a norm. And so now they would be on the bottom rung or be expelled or whatever. But it's not clear to me what the the practical procedure would be for doing that. Yeah, I would say he definitely does get a little bit fuzzy here when he's talking about how you would expel people who are lazy, which I mean, he does say, for instance, uh, you know, he does say that essentially uh, uh, here he says, quote, um, somebody has said that dust is merely matter who has settled in the wrong place. The same definition applies for nine tenths of those called lazy. So he, he does seem to think that the majority of supposedly lazy people, and he uses examples such as Darwin, which is a famous example. He was very lazy in school, did terrible, absolutely terrible really? in school. Yeah. He, he just ignored his studies, didn't do anything, but he would read in his spare time, very interested in things. But he never attended right. classes and just basically um, nearly failed and everything like that. But then, you know, he found something that interested him and he produced one of the greatest works of science. Right. Um, right. Which no doubt required uh, a certain level of intellect. Um, and he uses other examples of the sort. Um, but he does seem to think that, like, at the end of the day, there probably will be a few lazy people and you've just got to sort of expel them. And again, he does get a little bit fuzzy here, it would seem to me, at least. Maybe he's going to clarify it. We still have a little bit of the book to go. Um, but it, it does seem to be a little bit fuzzy. It seems to be somewhat analogous, as I'm reading it, as to sort of exile we might have heard in previous societies. So, for instance, you know, Aristotle getting exiled or, you know, um, 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 what was that? Julius Was Julius Caesar exiled? No, it wasn't Julius Caesar. He proposed um, a number of people to get exiled. Anyway, exile was a very famous punishment, and Roman citizens were also always granted the possibility of exile over, I believe, execution if they didn't want to be executed. And so in, in any case, that was a very common form of punishment in ancient societies. But this seems to be somewhat analogous because he does seem to think that there's basically communes which are going to be interested in specific things or specific groups. And so you could basically just kick them out and then look, if no commune accepts you, well, then, you know, you're going to have to start working, right? Uh, and right. so that seems to be just his general approach. I wonder, though, how this would map on to a contemporary society where the state has so reformulated our modes of living that we don't really live in isolated or separated communities anymore, right? I mean, I suppose even just a few hundred, you know, like 130 years ago when, when Kropotkin was writing, you know, it, it was a little bit more like you had this city, you had that village, and they were a bit more separated. Today, there's a lot of suburbs, and it, and it seems like in a lot of places, um, everything is very deeply interconnected in a way that might not be today. And so I do wonder how this sort of mechanism, which Kropotkin seems to think would, you know, would sort of work, would play out in a modern society or even really just play out, I should say contemporary society or even just play out in a modern society, which Kropotkin is talking about. Um, so I, I would, I, maybe he's going to clarify that later, but yeah, that's definitely a question that I have for sure. Yeah, that's the question is what, what exactly would you do and who, who would be acceptable to exile? I mean, if you have no rules, we kind of mentioned right. this earlier, if you have no rules, then you can have groups exiling people for what we would consider horrible reasons right based on race and culture and you know all sorts of stuff to say you're not you're not welcome here or if somebody you know if we had what the, there was a good question about what if there was you know a um like a person who had special needs 
And then as a community, if you decided, well, this person's not going to be able to produce um, far more than they, than they can consume, how do you approach that kind of stuff? So I think it definitely right. gets into a messy area when we start talking about expelling people from a group and doing it in a way that is um, ethical. Right, and, and which seems to be, according to Kropotkin, on the basis of kind of laziness. I, I mean, how do you right. distinguish laziness from someone who's just struggling or someone who, you know, I, I, right. I mean, we were talking about it before we started recording. My sister has special needs, and, and you know, any society which is going to exclude my sister is going to exclude me too, right? And, right? and there isn't a way to make that distinction clearly, and this is something that it seems to me that, you know, the most noble of societies are the ones which take care of the most vulnerable, um, and, you know, I find the most joy, the most happiness in, in my life, um, from, you know, when I can care for my sister, you know, like this is, you know, caring for others is, is deeply tied up with the finding of well-being. Uh, mm -hmm. and to that extent, I don't know that this is something which Kropotkin is directly, directly addressing. And this is a concern that I had earlier in the book as well. I mean, Kropotkin's focus on well-being throughout this book has been focused on individualistic well-being, which is to say, well-being accrued for myself. But how do we actually cultivate the caring for other people in a way which isn't just merely mechanistic? I mean, we right. do seem to great seem to gain great value from caring for other people. That's how we are as a, as a species, as a people. And, um, this is something that Kropotkin is at least, you know, at least from for me coming from my perspective, I would need to see Kropotkin address more directly if I was to feel comfortable, um, you know, in a society which Kropotkin specifically is advocating for. Yeah, and I think it's, um, I I think it's interesting because it would, I don't know, it would be kind of a hard, I don't know, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but it's a. Uh, where was I trying to... Well, it's just difficult. I mean, it's just difficult to think oh, about. Oh, right. Yeah, and I've kind of... I've sort of, over my lifetime, I've kind of made made a change where as the point I'm in in my life now, I definitely care much more about other people. Like, I've kind of learned that over the years. I know when I was younger and really didn't have as much as I even needed, I mean, that was not necessarily my number one concern was like looking out for other people, making sure others are taken care of. And I would agree with you that as, um, that I, you know, becoming a parent and all sorts of stuff, like you start to, f you get that deeper sense of value in helping other people. And you, you truly start to realize that how valuable that is to help others and bring that help to other people, especially when you know it's a help that they either would have very, a difficult time bringing to themselves or that they are unable to bring to themselves yeah. and you can provide that to someone and you can lift them up and sometimes it doesn't even cost you that much right as far as either physical effort or something but you can you can really change someone else with their day with a minimal effort and i think that's one of the things i like about kropotkin's vision here is that if everyone was looking out for everyone else i think there's a lot that we could create i mean i mm. think there's a you know, it wouldn't really be a question of shortage. It would be a question of how much, you know, I think you could easily create plenty because right now we're all running around trying to do as little as possible and, and each get our cut of the share, you know, and you do just enough to create that. But if it really was a, a sense of, well, this, this work that I do right now is really going to help the whole community. I think there would be a power to that, that a lot of people would, would recognize. Right. So, right. Um, and, and Oh, I'm sorry, were Go you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say I have a comment here. So it's kind of off topic about communism and anarchism. Uh, how can people live without rules, which is a huge topic. I mean, that's kind of the... Uh, yeah, I that's kind that of... a quick answer for that. That's a lot of what the whole book is about. But you, we're sort of... You're looking... It's not a quick answer. You're, we're looking at lots of little ways that sort of contribute to that overall I, idea. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, to some extent, Kropotkin's response here with, uh, you know, like uh, the, the lazy objection that he's answering in this particular chapter is also a response to that concern over rules. Now, I want to go back to what you were saying um, there. You know, something I've found is that actually by caring for other people, you learn to care for them more. In other words, just by performing the act towards an individual, you find yourself um, 
becoming closer to that person and wanting to care for them more. And I think that that's something which, you know, needs to be cultivated in our lives. Now, of course, the concern is always that you can go too far in that direction and you can end up in a situation where, you know, you're not actually ever caring for yourself because obviously self-care is very important, right? Like if you, you know, are constantly trying to help other people and you never take time to, you know, really reflect on yourself and, and, you know, just do something for, for you, you can ultimately have that burnout and then you can become resentful of the help that you're giving other people. And that's never a good situation, which you want to yeah. be in. It is about, I think, situating, I mean, I don't want to sound too cheesy here, but, you know, sort of situating your heart in, in a right way, finding the routines in your life, which can allow your heart to be situated in, in, in a right way that you can, you know, take pleasure in doing good. Because oftentimes we don't merely want to do good. We don't just want to give money to, you know, some, to, to a, to a homeless person, we want to also take pleasure in doing that good. And, you know, right. bringing those two things together is really important such that the actions of a good thing is not merely following some duty, following some deontological principle of like, I'm going to do a good thing here. It's also about cultivating a sort of a virtue as well and cultivating happiness in, uh, in doing good. Um, which is one thing that I think we do sort of do the opposite of in modern day society, right? I feel like our, our modern day culture is very individualistic, right? It's very much yeah. about the individual. And even a lot of the propaganda you hear when discussing these is what about the freedoms of the individual and what about, you know, all, all these kind of, of things when you realize what we would get is a much more communal system. You would know right. people. I mean, right now in, in most neighborhoods, you don't even really know your neighbors, the people that you live next to all for years and years and years. And now people barely know the people that they live around and stuff. And we're just, especially now with, I mean, I'm taking us off track, but social media and everything, it's like, we, we just don't actually know the humans around us. We, we know the humans we used to know and we connect to them through Facebook or whatever, but the actual humans in your neighborhood, maybe you don't know them so well. And it, and it makes a lot of these ideas in this book, I think a little harder to grasp at because right. it's so foreign to how, how we do things today. Right. And, and again, I think that, you know, f being able to find happiness in doing good, like linking, bringing together happiness and the good, that's where I think you really flourish at when you can learn to take pleasure and be happy at the, you know, providing for other people. Um, as I, you know, as, as you find when, you know, you care for people with special needs or you care for people who are sick or, uh, elderly, like, you know, finding, being able to find pleasure in that thing, which you know, as know of as good is, it seems to me like the fulfillment of, human life. But again, you do have to strike that balance. It can't just constantly be mandatory. It can't just constantly be like, oh, I have to do this because then you're going right. to grow that resentment for caring for other people. You have to be able to sort of be able to take steps back and take time for self-care. And it, so it is about striking that balance. But if you go too far on the individualist side of things, you do miss out on those opportunities, which you were just referring to, or miss out on those opportunities to help other people and find happiness in helping other people, which again, it seems to me, bringing together the happiness and the duty angle, where it's not just a question of duty that you can really find um, fulfillment, uh, fulfillment in life. Now, I want to sort of move through this book a little bit. You had some concerns about, or I don't know if they were concerns, but comments, because he talks about teaching and uh, things like that. And obviously, um, that's sort of up your alley a little bit. Um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, so I, I think he actually has a point here where he talks about the education system and the education system itself sort of knocking the... Uh, sort of introducing the laziness into people through our education system. And I think that um, I would agree with that. I mean, as someone I didn't, you know, when I was younger, I didn't, w we moved a lot when I was younger. I had, um, when I was in my early twenties, I had had, you know, more addresses than I had had years on the planet. So we moved a lot. And there were times where I went to schools, which were not great. Right. Um, there were times I went to okay schools, but there were times where I was in schools that were definitely subpar. And, it, it was a different reality. You didn't want to, you just, there was no reason to be excellent to, you know, even if you were interested in something, the teachers were sort of taking the, any kind of interest or anything out of it. And I, and as a, you know, as a professor myself and my wife's a teacher, I, I sort of have some insight into this. I would, I would say, um, you know, part of that is, 
you know, when we're in the classroom, we don't get free reign. We're told by the state or whatever what it is we're supposed to be teaching in the classroom. So we're already kind of handcuffed anyways. And then on top of that, you have teachers who can make things interesting and teachers who don't. But um, I would say there are definitely settings where that educational system can steal um, hmm. that interest of people. And, you know, if someone's interested in something, you can ruin that subject for them pretty quickly by teaching it the wrong way. So he talks about, you know, sort of, yeah. uh, and you had alluded to his, his educational earlier, but he talks to ways in which you can make it more interesting, which is a lot of what's actually going on in society right now, or, or in education, I should say right now, where there's a movement to go back and make it less rote and less just learn learn all these different factoring techniques and then take the test. It's more about trying to see the big picture and how do you put all these things together in a way that not only can you use in your life, but hopefully will give you some tools to think about things uh, when you're doing stuff. And that's that's hard to do. I mean, that's one reason why really great teachers are absolutely fantastic is because it is like a, an art form when you can do this really well because, um, and, and there's lots of things that go into it, right? Students coming from different households and, you know, they're all bringing their different baggage to the classroom and stuff. But um, teaching done well, I, I would say, can definitely steal that motivation from students and it can squash that. If there's a bit of a spark in them, you can easily put that spark out if you're not careful with the way they're being being educated. Um, yeah. You know, there's a big picture. Education's influenced by so many things that it's it's hard to talk about. But I, when I read what he was saying, I can I can say there are definitely parts of education where I would agree with what you're saying, including as a math professor, I would say there are some of the ways that mathematics is taught. Um, I, I get why everyone hates mathematics. I hated mathematics until I got to the other side of calculus because of the way that it's taught. It just makes you, you're like, okay, I'm just going to memorize this stuff and reproduce it. it there, there's not that interest. And that's what he's talking about is take someone out, um, show them natural sciences out in the world and, you know, get them interested in things, show them how to build things with their hands rather than just being in a book all day long. And he uses the examples of studying dead languages uh, which, you know, a dead language can be very interesting to some people, but if you're not a person who wants to study a dead language, that's the kind of thing that could make a person not want to go to school. Why, why am I doing this, you know? Yeah, I, I hated Latin when I when I studied it for, for quite a while until we started reading actual texts. Like, we started reading Ovid's Metamorphosis, we started reading Augustine, like in the original Latin, and you know, then I suddenly had an incentive to learn it very quickly. And I was like, oh, this is very fascinating. Like the different things that you could take out of a text when you understand its original language and, you know, you understand that sort of grammatical angle can be quite interesting. And it is very difficult, I think, especially in the case of a foreign language to, uh, you know, be able to give the big picture while simultaneously teaching the right. small parts of it. It can be really, really difficult. And I imagine in the case of, of mathematics as well, or perhaps especially, um, and it's not even clear, I should say, to all mathematicians, like what mathematics like really is like in the in the abstract, if you could even, you know, have some sort of um, overarching definition. So, I mean, these things are like really difficult questions, um, which are really difficult to you know, speak on. I mean, I've definitely experienced that, Chris, where, you know, you take a test on something and you just had to study and cram it all in your brain. And then you just, you never, even if it's a subject you love, like you don't want to think about it again for the next three months. You're just, you know, you're done right. with it for the next three months. Even if you love the subject, it just completely shut off your brain because the way it was taught or the way that uh, the yeah. tests were and the force, the sort of forced rigor of it um, can really sort of squash that from you. So yeah, absolutely. I definitely, um, I, I definitely, de I definitely empathize with a lot of what Kropotkin was saying here, um, about schooling and how, um, you know, you need to really, you need to make it in such a way that can provide a spark for people so that they're not, you know, perceived as lazy. Right. That like when we think about laziness, we can't just think, you know, look at the results. You also need to look at the whole, the, the whole system in question. Like, okay, well, whenever you see someone lazy, you shouldn't just jump to the conclusion, oh, that person is lazy. You also need to start asking other questions about the, the, the person's, you know, uh, nutrition, the person's upbringing, the person's well-being right. in that respect. What are the teachers involved? What is that person's particular, um, you know, emotional sort of balance? And how does that relate to these things? And um, Kropotkin seems to think here, and he even says so much, that 
in a sort of anarchist society, we would actually need to think about society in that way. You would need to think about laziness that way so then we don't just kick everybody out for being lazy. Like you would need to sort of find the best ways to maximize uh, organization. Again, going back to that dust quote where he says, somebody has said that dust is merely matter gone into the wrong place. The same definition applies to nine-tenths of those who are called lazy. So he seems to think that an anarchist society would have a sort of belt-in mechanism because they don't want to just ex uh, exile everybody. They don't want to just expel everybody to make sure that everybody can get in the, into the right place. I don't know about that if I'm being honest. Like I, I liked, I would like to believe it, but I, you know, some of the things that I see from people, and maybe this is just an artifact of capitalist society, but there's a lot of people who really love retribution and think that that's, you yeah. Know, and and I'll, and I'll say we even see it on the left. You'll see, you know, whenever somebody that they don't like got their coming up in, uh, you know, people retweeting it and having like hearts and stuff around it. And, and I'll admit it. Yeah. Sometimes I watch it and I like it, you know, a little bit, like it sort of yeah. riles you it's up a little bit. Up in that. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to get caught up in that. But Kropotkin seems to think here in this chapter, and he's even alluded to this a little bit in the past, for instance, when he said that, um, if we had to build an anarchist society it would have to include the bourgeois, like we can't just, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, we, we can't use the guillotine, right? We, we need to find a way to bring them in, um, right. in a way in which they like this new society. Um, otherwise you won't ever achieve it. Um, Kropotkin seems to think that we need to be able to put aside those root, those, um, I don't want to use the word reptilian because then we get into conspiracy theories, but you know, these sort of animalistic, um, um, attitudes of ourselves towards retribution that we need to, yeah. you know, find ways to really move beyond those, those sentiments. And I worry that maybe that's asking too much of people. Maybe it's not, but it right. sounds hard. It sounds very, very difficult. I almost think that's the part that we could deal with if you if you had people because I've kind of made that change right I as I've as I've aged and I've gone through life I, I feel more like like I look at the prison system now and I realize this shouldn't be about retribution it should be about um, helping people become members of society again so that they don't have that need to commit crimes or you know whatever it is that that occurred so you know, you want to get away from retribution. I, I think that would come with society. I think it would all, it would go along with this thing of people sort of coming together as a community and realizing when I go to work, yeah, I, I could get away with not going to work today. But if I did that for very long, the society would kind of fall apart. So I kind of would hope, maybe I'm being too optimistic, that that part would kind of come along with the cultural change. The thing that I would call him out on that I don't know that I agree with is this idea that you could peacefully introduce the the bourgeois into society because i you know it, i and i don't in any way condone violence but uh, you just want i mean is jeff bezos just gonna like give it all up so he can go work four hours a week in a factory five times four hours five times a week is jeff right. bezos gonna do that i mean I, I just sort of don't really see how that would happen so i, I mean i would hope that it could I, you know i my hope is that it, as we move forward in society and make positive changes, we do it through democracy. We do it through people working together. We do it through positive means. And the, you know, I, I certainly am not calling for revolution or violence in in any way. I just wonder how you would get the, the people on board. I mean, that's that mentality you live if you're in that top one percent is that you're special and you get to live this godlike life. I mean, why would you give up the godlike life? if you didn't have to, right? To go be like a mere mortal. Who's, who's going to do that? And so <laughs> Jesus, asking right? <laughs> them to do it voluntarily, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? Uh, I said Jesus, right? Who's going to give up the God life like? I mean, <laughs> right. it sounds... Right. right, no, but that's the point. Like, it sounds, um, it sounds a little bit difficult to imagine. It sounds really, really hard. I'm I'm happy to hear your optimism that we could get people to move forward and abandon those retribution, uh, you know, sort of retribution and, and, and the like. I, I think I, some of these ideas are kind of like ingrained. Like I think capitalism itself, I think, is we don't really teach capitalism. I think we indoctrinate capitalism. Right. And oh, I think sure. this retribution is something that's we learn retribution as a natural thing. Right. We feel good when someone who hurts kids gets what they have coming, right? And you and you you sort of feel like justice was served. But, you know, sometimes you you kind of learn to fight that a little bit and say, well, how can we just 
make the situation better, right? And and, and that you know, yeah. no one wants to ever see anyone hurt hurt kids or whatever, and people should, you know, pay consequences for those acts. But the the ultimate goal, like, should be how do, how do we put society right so this kind of thing doesn't happen again, and we don't have this person repeat offending, and, and what, how, what can we do to sort of help people? Is right. a different point of view, but you know, sometimes people have to be shown that point of view because it's not the immediate thing that they think of. Yeah, and it's really, really difficult to cultivate those sorts of virtues. It seems like, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that society would need to expend a lot of resources in to making it so that people grow up this way. And Kropotkin seems to think that that's ultimately going to be the only way that we that we move forward, that we stop viewing lazy people or people who do bad things as immediately it's their fault. We have to think about how society can can reshift things so that they're not just the dust floating around in the wrong place, that they're not just, as he says again, matter in the wrong place. Um, yeah, it's difficult. It's for sure. It's for sure tough. Yeah. It's, some, it's some stuff. It's some tough stuff. Uh, any other main things that you wanted to go over in this? Um, I think we, I think we kind of mostly hit through all of, uh, all of chapter him, 12 yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. I think we hit that chapter 12. Um, yeah. So just, just to comment on a comment here in the, uh, in the, in the comments here in the chat. So it's uh, public citizen is saying capitalism is the natural order of humanity in one form or another. It's not indoctrination, it's nature. You can, you can't fight mother nature. Yeah. So that's actually, um, that's a point that's held up by quite a few people. That's one of the things well, that regularly gets, gets held against the, you know, this, this kind of book and this kind of theming thinking, and it definitely is addressed early in earlier chapters. So I'm just kind of putting that out there so people can take a look yeah. if they want. I don't remember what part of the book, well, but so, there is – oh, go ahead. Oh, please. as I say, so Kropotkin's main analysis – I hope my audio isn't too terrible still. Um, but Kropotkin's main analysis is essentially like a kind of biological one, right? Like he – I mean he's, yeah. he's taking the work of Darwin and trying to sort of in a sense turn it on its head in, in a sociological interpretation. I mean there was a lot of Darwinians early on that took it – to mean that, well, this means that society when maximized is one which, you know, everybody's fighting against one another. Kropotkin says that actually we should reshift this and think about the progress of evolution as a question of how a species responds to its environment and sort of retilting that um, that angle. So Kropotkin's entire book book is a response to that. So certainly, you know, I would recommend kind of going through this book and look, you might not agree, right? Like you might not right. ultimately agree. I'm, I, I'm definitely more so on the left and you can tell by some of the concerns that I've, I've raised, I'm not sure that I completely buy all the arguments that he's giving us. Um, I think that he's onto some things. That's my take. But I think that there are some parts where I'm sort of just like, I don't know if that's really how it would play out. So, you know, you know, look at the book through yourself for yourself and, right. you know, really think through these objections is is my view on it. Um, I wouldn't ever really jump to the conclusion that something is natural. Like it's, you know, there's a lot of things that people have said are natural. People said that the church was natural, that the hierarchy of the church was, you know, like all these things in, in, in the past, people always seem to say, well, this is natural. That's natural. Um, it seems like, you know, any society, any culture always says that their organization system is natural, that the divine right, right. of kings, this is natural. You know, like yeah. I, I think that anytime you evoke a question of saying, oh, well, this is natural. It's the only way things could ever be. I think that it might be true, right? Like maybe we found the best and only way that society could run and be organized. Um, but I think that there are just so many different options out there that you should be inherently skeptical of that of that position. That's my opinion. Right. Maybe you disagree, but that's sort of my uh, my take on that. Like you should put an extra level of skepticism whenever you assume that something is natural. Yeah, and I should clarify. I'm not necessarily saying that you can't have a valid um, view towards capitalism. Like that is definitely possible that someone can say, "Well, I prefer capitalism for these reasons." The reason I'm calling it indoctrinization is because um, I feel like it's just sort of taken without, like in this country when you grow up, it's just sort of taken as capitalism is the only way that can exist. And as soon as you bring up these other ways, and you, you certainly weren't doing this in the chat, but as soon as you bring up other possibilities, people are immediately jumping on it to, to you know, it's almost like it's just been ingrained in there that they, they can't, be, oh, many people can't listen to these ideas like this book would, you know, some people would just think it was 
complete rubbish. They, can't, they aren't even open to those ideas. And I think that happens pretty early for a lot of people. I, I do acknowledge that you can have a valid view that um, uh, capitalism is the right one. Like, uh, so I'm not invalidating that point well, of view. And, and, even... and I think, and, and, oh, and just let me add, so I think his other book that's really famous, Mutual Aid, I haven't read it yet, but I have watched a couple of videos summarizing it. And I believe in that book, he looks at a lot of natural situations and look, because, you know, the, the argument can be made, well, um, capitalism, if you look at the prey and predator model, then it's the person going out and taking what they can get sort of somewhat uh, as like capitalism. But he, Kropotkin, I believe, goes through and makes numerous cases where cooperation is natural in animals. So ants, right? You can never have a single ant. An ant can only, ant colonies only exist when they are cooperating together, when they are working together for the good of everyone, right? So I believe that's a lot of what he talks about in mutual aid is taking, or at least he addresses, is looking at nature and saying how this community and working together, it, that, I think that's his point, is it is in mm. fact a natural way of doing things. And, and, I'll just, and I'll just add one other point to this question of capitalism being natural. Um, which one? Which capitalism? You know, every single country yeah. has a different form of capitalism. You know, in Germany, workers are given and the en environmentalist and local communities are given a nearly 50 percent stake in the bo on the boards of large corporations. In France, workers also have certain rights that are different than the rights that are given in the United States. So every single country has a different form of capitalism, and oftentimes they vary um, quite substantially. So, yeah. you know, if you're going to say that capitalism is natural, I hear that, and that's like, you know, it's a reasonable thing to think. Again, there's, you know, possibly thousands, and there have been throughout history, thousands of other ways of organizing society. Um, but then even now, you're going to say, okay, capitalism is natural. Well, which form of capitalism is natural? Because all of these other forms seem to still exist. Um, and so, you know, I think that it does bear, like, well, you should probably, I guess, like, you know, like, it seems to me at least that, like, saying that something is natural is, like, a very strong claim. Like a like a like an incredibly mm -hmm. strong claim that's really difficult, not only just to prove, but just very difficult to even know for sure that anything is ever really natural. I mean, even, you know, uh, I, I mean, I suppose you could maybe say breathing is natural, but like, what do you even mean when you say breathing is natural? It's not clear what that would even really entail. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't know. Uh, in any case, is that yeah. is that about it for chapter 12? Or I think that's about it for 12. Yeah. Awesome. So next time around, what do you want to look at? You want to look at chapter 13. It's kind of, it's, it's about maybe the same length as, as, uh, this, as this one. Let's see how many pages 14 is. Yeah. I kind of looked at it. I think we maybe go one chapter next time. Okay. Just chapter, chapter just chapter yeah. 13. Okay. All right. Awesome. So next time around, we'll be looking at chapter 13, the collectivist wages system. So it'll be more so responding to the objections of state communism um, or the concerns of, of state communism and saying that there's problems there, being that Kropotkin is an anarchist. And uh, he has had a lot of interesting criticisms of Marx, which I find more compelling than some of the criticisms which capitalists level on Marx. So um, yeah. I'm looking forward to Chapter 13. So if you all are interested in that, uh, hit the follow button either for Chris or I. And um, yeah, we'll be here back again next week, Wednesday, 730 Eastern, 430 Pacific.